this all started because John Sharkey um, asked me about this topic because he had put up a video on Facebook uh, showing some one of the models he had in the flexibility of bones and did something about bone and fascia and he had a comment on it which was critical and he wanted in my opinion so I you know I wrote this little bit on it and it's gone viral and I'm not quite sure why but uh, people are anxious about it and the question is is bone is fascia and of course bone is fascia and as far as I'm concerned I've lectured on this topic for years. It's been one of the things I put in my slideshow, so it's nothing new to me, and it's always been considered fascia, and it's embryology, embryologically a fascia, so why not? Some of it goes back, believe it or not, to 2002, when I did a little research work with a uh, a, a person called uh, Melissa Not, not Tate, um, who is presently uh, uh, a name chair professor uh, at the Youth University in, uh, uh, I think, in Sydney, Australia. So she's, I mean, she's gone a long way, but even then she was pretty well uh, known in the field. And we did a little paper that we presented at um, the International Society for Biomechanics, which met in Zurich uh, in 2002. I did a poster session, he did, she did a, piece, uh, a paper presentation, but it was never published, and so we never wrote it up and never made a big deal of it. But at that time, she was doing work on osteocytes and got in, it got in touch with me because she was finding that these osteocyte connections were really a tensegrity connection. And so we did a little paper on osteocytes is a tensegrity structure, biotensegrity structure, and backwards from it. But during that time, of course, this is what she did. She's a, a, bio, a bioengineer in bone physiology. And we talked about the periosteum connects directly with the osteocytes through all the channels that she described in bone. And there wasn't any question about it. But so, so, so it's always been a factor is that you have this fascia that becomes ossified by these osteocytes that they bring into it. Yeah, and then it's a you know, response to the stress and strains of mechanics that's been in Wolf's Law and Davis's Law and all these laws beforehand. So it's nothing new. It's been a standard concept. And last night I started thinking, why is this a problem? And the problem is because of the same thing that we have in the United States with understanding the Constitution. There are the people called the originalists in the United States who believe that the Constitution that was written just about 200 years ago should be interpreted in its original language. Now, how anybody understands what that original language is, I don't know, but that's how the originalists believe, and that's this all this big fight now we have about getting somebody appointed to the Supreme Court who either are originalists or who are essentially evolutionists who believes that you know, a lot of things have happened since then and we should keep the intent of what was said in the Constitution but understand how things have evolved. Well, of course, fascia goes back to that is that the original concept of the fascia was wrapping up a bundle and putting tying things together. It was the tying of the tissues together so that the original, original understanding from the anonymous point of view was that it tied the tissues together. Well, now we know a lot more about how tissues evolve. This day we're talking in gross anatomy terms and we understand now that there's an evolutionary concept and that cells are tied together, that 
the first division of cells gets two cells, and those two cells aren't just stuck together by surface adhesions, they're stuck together by integrins and material and the intercellular fluid, which is really a structure, not a, a liquid. It has structure, and therefore there's integrins in it and all sorts of things that tie these team, things together physically. And that not only that, but the extracellular fluid and structure integrate directly into the cell, into the intracellular structure, into the nuclear structure. So there's a direct connection between the nucleus of one cell and the nucleus of the other cell, physical connection between these two, and so on. And it keeps going that way so that if we wanted to find fascia as what binds us together, then you have to start at the intracellular fluid, which is, again, not a liquid, it's a structure. And again, you just think of snot, which is one of my favorites, and you look at snot and it's, you know, it's mucousy, liquid-like, but it's not a liquid because if you look on your hand when you get or out of your clothes, it doesn't stick and get the thing wet. It's, it's an adherent glob. And as it dries and desiccates and the water that is integrated in the structure dries out and evaporates out, it becomes tough and sinewy and opaque rather than the clear. So that, that it's, it's a structure that binds these things together. Well, then you get all that together and you say, well, then what, what we're looking for is what binds things together. The bone is clearly part of that fascial extension system. And the osteocytes are the parenchyma within the bone. Which then gets us to what is a muscle, which then gets us to what is a kidney or a, or a urinary tract or the heart or the vascular system or the pulmonary system. Because if you define something like a kidney, you define it with or without its parenchyma. If you take the parenchyma away from the kidney, you have a bunch of cells that just sort of fall to the, you know, in the mess. There's no organization. So it's the the fascia organizes the body system and is the through which these parenchyma functions. So it uses the, so that it becomes the functional system within the organism. When we get to that part, then you have the, the internal functioning systems, the organ systems that are internal, and the system that interfaces with the external world and handles external forces. So if you're going to divide this fascial system into anything, that's where I would make a division is what's internal and what's external. But of course, you then get back to everything overlaps every place. How do you get a pound of flesh without making blood, you know, creating blood, you see? Everything gets integrated at some level. But if you look at the fascial system, of course, bone with you know, Harris and Stopak uh, have written about this, about how that the bone is actually caused, created within the fascial system as, as is muscles. And again, do you call muscle, what do you call muscle? Actually, the cells and muscles are, are soft and mushy and soupy and just flow out of every place, it, they work directly through the fascia. Without the fascia, there is no muscle. So, so muscle really is a combination of the muscle cells and its fascial structure, just as the kidney is a combination of the whatever cells are in the kidney, the parenchyma cells, and the fascial structure. And you could say the same of bone. And you could say the same of heart. And you could say the same of, you know, any organ or organ system. So 
to me, this is trying to understand this from the original concept of what fascia is and putting it into a sensible model that says, okay, anything that we'll call the parenchyma, the cells doing whatever they're doing is one thing. And then what binds it all together and makes it functional, the, the, the fascia. Uh, and that's where that article came from. So if you have decalcified bone, as Sharkey demonstrates, you can tie it in a knot. You now add osteocytes to the bone matrix, and as Melissa had pointed out, it's a tensegrity network. The ossifieds plaster the walls with hydroxyapatite crystals, which are calcium. You now have bone whose fabric is stiffened by the hydroxyapatite crystals, like a stiffly starched shirt. The bone is not a crystallized column of calcium, it is a specialized condensation and density within the fascia. 